the education system isn't broken. It's doing what it was always meant to do. It's doing what it was designed for. But the world in which we live and work today is a completely different beast. And, and the education system hasn't changed. You know when you're out with your workmates and it hits a point in the evening when someone says, all right, enough shop talk, what else is going on? And that's where the real conversation starts. This podcast is that conversation. My name is Arma Iqbal, and over the last 20 years leading innovation at companies like Facebook and Deloitte, I've met lots of interesting people. Sure, their day jobs sound cool, but I've always been fascinated by the real-life stories behind the executives. My guest today is Leah Jovi Ford. As well as being the CEO of an edtech platform, Leah is an advocate for alternative education. Here's my conversation with Leah. Leah, thank you so much for joining us today on the Enough Shop Talk podcast. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. A pleasure to talk with you as always. Okay, there's lots to talk about today, but before we get started, what I wanted to do is give you the opportunity to sort of set the context and tell us about yourself. So here we go. In 60 seconds or less, can you tell us who you are, what you do, and what your day job is. Sure. Uh, I'm Leah Jovi Ford. Professionally, I am the co-founder of an edtech startup called Diverse Leaders Group, and we are building a virtual university to teach Masters of Equality. Amazing. Wow. That was very concise and uh, definitely less than 60 seconds. Okay. So let me just backtrack a little bit on a few of those things then, because you, you it rolls off the tongue and it's all normal to you. But so... A couple of true or false questions before we get into the topic of, of today. So as well as being the CEO of a company, you also educate all of your kids at home. True or false? True. What does that look like on a daily basis? It's it's kind of like the extracurricular stuff that people do with their kids, but it's pretty much that full time. And I, I suppose more than just a philosophy, you actually committed to building an ed tech startup you mentioned as well. Um, during the pandemic so that other parents could also follow in your footsteps. What did you learn from that experience? Yeah, I think it, it start, the EdTech startup started more because we saw people struggling. So when everything was locked down and, and kids were at home and parents were at home, we saw almost everyone we knew around us struggling. And we'd kind of been here, done that uh, and been doing it for years. So we were like, how can we help? Um, and it and it was different. I think the important thing to note was that you know there was a huge distinction between what we're doing and what people had to do during COVID and during lockdowns. Um, but I think I learned two key things. One, which confirmed what I thought I already knew, but very clearly saw in front of my eyes, was that education systems aren't serving children. Without direction, without kind of almost the spoon feeding they get, they struggle to know what to do. They struggle to learn. They need that almost constant. I think many parents will kind of confirm this. They need that almost constant micromanagement and and kind of input, which is great on one level, but it, it's we don't get that as adults. Well, actually, we do. That's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't get that as adults. We shouldn't need it as adults. Um, and then I think the other thing that we saw, which I guess you could probably call some success success stories, were that when given a taste back of the freedom they they had, and kind of reconnected to their innate love of learning, they could learn again. Kids kids were passionate, interested, motivated to learn and to kind of follow their interests, as opposed to being told what to do constantly, almost you know day in day out eight hours a day. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think that's a great summary and a great lead in as well. So this is called the Enough Shop Talk podcast. And today we're not talking about shop. We're talking about the topic of, I'm going to call it unschooling, but I know we're going to unpack that term a little bit as we go through. So look, I've heard a little bit about unschooling through some podcasts, and I think that it's become something of a movement over the last decade or so. Really, I think the core philosophy is straying away from mainstream, one-size-fits-all model of uh, children's learning. So as I say, I've heard a little bit about it, but I feel there are different perspectives that don't necessarily align into a nicely packaged sort of definition of what unschooling is. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what is unschooling, how it varies in different parts of the world, and also how what you are doing is perhaps a bit different from the, the core concept of unschooling. 
Sure. I'm um, I'm not somebody who goes and looks at all the definitions and uh, varieties of something. So I uh, I looked this up. <laughs> I thought you might ask me about it in terms of the kind of official definition of unschooling. And what I found was that, um, as with many things, its inception is claimed to be a part of the counterculture of 1970s America. Um, I'm suspicious of that because uh, I think they often want to claim ownership of many things that ha actually probably existed in the first place. Um, you know, unschooling is really like the natural way we all learn. When left to our own devices, if you think about how we learn and you think about how kids learn from the start as babies, they learn to eat, they learn to talk, they learn to walk, uh, you know, and it comes from us. So I, I think it's, yeah, it's a label for something that kind of happens already. <laughs> Um, it has been claimed, though, as a specific movement, and I think it's because of the sort of more progressive, and it is counterculture, it's progressive approach to education than the current mainstream, um, usually state-controlled education. Um, it does differ from country to country. So the, in the US, unschooling as a term is a very specific, quite rigid movement um, that, again, is quite ironic given the name of it and given the term for it um but they're quite i would say my experience of them is that they're very militant so if, if you don't do it like this you are not an unschooler and you cannot call yourself an unschooler um whereas in the uk i it, i experience it as much more kind of flexible um and adaptable and it's much more it's less of a strict movement that you do or don't belong to and it's much more of a philosophy and kind of set of beliefs that with which you educate your children um so i ascribe much more to that aspect which is we as parents tend to know our kids best and we know what they do and don't respond to and sometimes they don't respond to us at all my kids don't learn from me they're very adverse to learning from me um so it's figuring out the, the the ways that they learn best, the things that they're most interested in, and it, and it's very much about self direction. I don't want to have to be sort of teaching them or learning can't can't learn for them, but directing what they do, controlling what they do, managing what they do constantly on a day to day basis, hour by hour. I would much rather they learn how to be independent in their learning and with their education and follow the things that interest them. Oh, you know, we put so much pressure on kids to try and figure out what they want to do when they're an adult you know from age seven or you know however however young they are we ask them what do you want to do what do you want to be when you grow up they don't know you know I didn't know I still don't really know um, it, it's you know it's kind of following my interests and following my passions and falling into things that I'm interested in and feel, feel really um, strongly about and knowing what to do about that and knowing what the different sort of avenues are and channels and platforms and outlets are for that and then creating them myself or going and finding someone who has created something and that's what I want my children to have is that ability to almost kind of you know find the threads and follow them and see where it takes them and know that they're equipped with the skills and, and resources um, and can find them if they need to uh, to to follow the follow those interests absolutely and I love that you started that with uh Unschooling kind of began philosophically as something of a counterculture movement. It reminds me, I read lots about the history of rock and roll. And when people talk about the birth of punk rock, right? Punk rock was this rebellion against everything in the establishment, but very quickly they created a set of rules. You can't have long hair. Your hair needs to be a certain way. You need to dress a certain way. You can't listen to certain bands. And all of a sudden the thing that was supposed to be no rules became so boxed in with so many strict rules. And I can kind of see how you know, people might see themselves as the guardians of this thing because they feel very strongly about it. But at the same time, I think everything you've just described is about flexibility, is about facilitating rather than boxing in. So um, I can see why it takes on different forms in different parts of the world. Okay, so second question. Now I'm going to play devil's ad advocate, which I hate to do, but let me just do that because I know there probably are some people listening to this who may be asking this question. So I'll ask a big question here. Why do we need any of this? What's wrong with just doing the normal thing and sending our kids to mainstream schools? Isn't this all just a solution that nobody asked for? So I'm going to tie that back to the point that you just made, which is we have these counterpoints and countercultures and sort of movements which rebel against what is. And then we end up 
recreating almost the same thing so we we move to something that seems more flexible and more adaptable and then we put rules around it and you know i think the question is where does that come from where does the need to own something come from where does the need to control it come from and we live in a patriarchal capitalist post-colonialist society and community and that has they have rules rules have come from you know we need to own we need to dominate we need to control we need to manage and that worked when post-industrial or kind of with the industrial economy we needed to have people who could do what they were told who could go into factories and do the same thing over and over and not question it um similar to officers you know we we we, we needed a workforce who could basically be I would call them robots, not think for themselves, not question, not be creative, not use their brains, not engage their brains. And so we set up the education system, which we're still stuck with, to create that. And what we have seen, obviously, in the last, I think it's really accelerated in the last two, three decades, is a completely different world of work. Post pandemic, you know, we all had to work remotely. Many of us are still working remotely or certainly choosing to work remotely. We got a taste of something else. And we're working in a much more globalized economy. None of that is has been designed for in the current education systems. So just on a basic level, the system, the education system isn't broken. It's doing what it was always meant to do. It's doing what it was designed for. But the world in which we live and work today is a completely different beast. And, and the education system hasn't changed. It's tried to and it's trying to, but it's, you know, the systems are so slow and incumbent that they can't move quickly enough. You know, look, I mean, you know, look at Meta, look at the metaverse, look at look at the technology and look at how technology has driven things so quickly and accelerated things so quickly. So the pandemic, in my view, was some of those trends were already there. The pandemic and the lockdowns accelerated them. Yeah, I think your point around the things that we are preparing kids for in school is ultimately to move into adult life, to go into the workplace. Right now, the whole conversation is around the, the metaverse, breaking down geographical barriers and the like, you know, that absolutely should be something within the educational space. But also the second point, and I think this is maybe some of the alarmists always like to say X is dead or X is broken. And that's a really nice headline. But the way you just summarize that education is the education system is not broken. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do. It's just that the world has moved on from that. I think that's a really key concept that sometimes gets lost in these sorts of conversations. So yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that one up. Okay, moving on. So again, this is a podcast that's called Enough Shop Talk, and we're not here to talk about your day job, but it would feel like a real missed opportunity not to bring up a little bit of your core expertise. So your day job is you're the CEO of Diverse Leaders Group, and you're the driving force behind the world's first equality university. That's a perfect intersection of everything that we're talking about here. So I do kind of need to ask a little bit, you are uniquely positioned to talk to that intersection. So we're living in a world that's shifting, having a global perspective and embracing the benefits of diversity are obviously becoming a bit of a baseline expectation for individuals, organization and institutions. So I guess the question there really is, do you think we should be entrusting schools to set up our kids for success on this front? sure you can predict my answer and it's no <laughs> i think we've lost trust in ourselves fundamentally but particularly as parents um you know our lives have been designed from us from school all the way through to work we've lost trust and the capacity in ourselves to parent our children and know what they need in the way that we can see the world of work is shifting and that you know we're all experiencing right now and it, you know it's very challenging right now um but, you know, when it comes to, I think, globalization, remote working, the fact that we are all exposed to many more different perspectives than we were before. And I think technology is a driver of that. You know, kids have access to iPads. They go, uh, you know, on kind of VR headsets. My son plays, um, I don't know what it's called, Gorilla Tag or something with a, with a, a kid in Sweden. And they kind of message in their <laughs> kind of Swedish and English. Neither of them speak really the, the other language. But they have, you know, they're being exposed to so many more different perspectives. And yet the education system that they 
largely grow up in tells one side of the story. So the curriculum are very biased. They're created by a certain kind of set of people, and it's typically white men, and it tells one side of the story and one perspective only. And that just, it doesn't serve them at all as they go into the world of work and realize that they are they are working with people who, you know, may live across the other side of the world and have a completely different culture and heritage, you know, different language, different societal norms. And it, neither one is right or wrong. You know, they all exist together and they ideally all exist in harmony. But we aren't we aren't encouraged to think about that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, I mean, I think when we we spoke kind of on this topic a while ago, one of the things you raised as well is, OK, great. So we have institutions, we have schools, and there, there is some role to play. But um, if they're not designed to do that, then how do we solve for this? And you brought up kind of the concept of, you know, that saying of it takes a village to raise a child and, you know, how different societies have had that in the past. So, you know, maybe you can share some some of your thoughts around that, which I thought were fascinating. Yeah, I think, you know, unfortunately, we've lost the village, most of us, particularly in the West. We 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 are so insular and we're so isolated. Um, I think what we experience with the kind of home education, certainly in the UK, is we have to take much, much more of an active part in our children's education. It, it's your responsibility, but it doesn't mean you are the only one who can teach them and who can raise them. And it's how do you expand their village? How do you expand their perspectives? Uh, you know, technology is great for that. How do you enrich their lives? Even if they're at school, it doesn't have to be either or. You know, I don't sit here going, you have to home educate. It's the only way. Um, not at all, because it is really difficult. And not everybody is equipped to do it. There are so many opportunities to educate your children or to facilitate the education of your children outside of the four walls of a classroom. And, you know, and you can you can do it in a car journey. You know, you look around the world and it doesn't mean that you have to know everything either. It's about curiosity and it's kind of modeling to them. Um, I think some of the things that we've lost, it's that kind of curiosity. Why Why is that like that? Why does that, you know, why does that work the way it works? How does that work? And then we've got the answers in our kind of fingertips, you know, in, on our phones and in Google, and we can look that up together. And it's modelling that constant, you know, innate love of learning and cur curiosity-driven approach. As you said before, like, nobody teaches you to walk. Kids learn to walk. And so we're, we're innately born with these things. And I think in a world where things are becoming increasingly polarized there's also kind of a hopeful message wrapped up in that it's not that i need to instill every single value that this child will ever have in the world it's just not a realistic goal to have they will soak up different things so the best thing you can do is kind of set them up to be able to process that and make sense of that so moving into my final question then i'm, I'm going to pick up on that word hope you used the word hope i want to end on a hopeful note um so everything you've said makes absolute sense, and I'm sure most parents would agree, at least philosophically, with everything you're saying. And yet, very few parents have taken the plunge and even considered or explored. Uh, I'm not even saying taking it on entirely, taking your kid's education on entirely yourself, but haven't even thought about, like, what role do I play um, in my child's learning journey? Um, so what would you say are the biggest barriers that you've uh, sort of seen and what maybe you've learned that could help others overcome those barriers? Mindset is key because, again, it's about questioning. And most of us, you know, we've been schooled in this system ourselves. So we don't always know that there is another way. We don't appreciate that there's an alternative because this is this is the way it's been. This is the way it's always been. This is what happened to us. So therefore, let's just follow this path. So just understanding and knowing that there are different options, I think, is a key thing. And it doesn't, you know, again, it doesn't have to be either or. It doesn't have to be school or you know, home education. It, there's a multitude of things in between. And it's figuring out kind of what that jigsaw puzzle looks like for you. Um, related to the mindset thing is is kind of confidence in oneself as a parent. And, you know, this most most parents say, but I'm not a teacher. I don't have teaching experience. I can't teach my kids. You don't need it. And it is, again, that that distinction. And it's, it's, it's a subtle nuance, but it's so important. You don't need to be a teacher. You just need to facilitate. And you have always facilitated your kids' learning because you facilitated them learning how to walk and learning how to eat and learning how to speak and all of those things. So, again, we have that, you know, we have that in us already. It's not something that we have to learn how to do. I like that. It's a it's a very structured approach. And so then it, it shows a very 
uh, simple path forward as well. So if you think about what you just said, okay, I'm a, a, a parent who is going down a traditional route. My kid is in school. What can I do about it? Well, a, a mindset shift in terms of philosophy could be school is good to get them to a baseline, but therefore my role to play is to get them to excel beyond just the baseline. Um, is that a, yeah. a helpful way to think about it? Yeah, I think so. You know, it isn't it isn't realistic for, for the entire kind of, you know, society and population to go, right, let's just let's home educate our kids. So what are they getting at school? And, you know, on your map of where you want to get to, what's that giving them? What resources, what tools is it giving them and what's still missing? And how can you fill those gaps? And, and you know, and, and the other part of that, and this is a kind of just a note of caution, because I know many kids have a ton of extra extracurricular activities because of that. That isn't always the way you know that isn't always the solution which is fill your kids time with more stuff it could be less it doesn't always have to be more it could be less relating it to yourself it's like they're little humans that you know they're, they're they are they're not adults they're humans and they still have needs and it doesn't always look like being told what to do all the time and kind of shoving them into a system and then forgetting about it it's you know where do they want to get to? It's constant conversation with them as well. I think that is, you know, even from a young age, and it doesn't also look like, what do you want to do? And let's set you up for that. It's, you know, what are you interested in? What are you curious about? It's getting down to their level. You know, these are kind of parenting tips, but they'll tell you, they already show you, you just have to pay attention. Amazing. Leah, this is all really super helpful. I'm going to ask just one final question then. Back of an envelope, if you could leave people with one key message then out of all of this, what is that message? you have the freedom to choose the education that your kids can receive and you know use it take the responsibility back and use it and, and let it be an engaging conversation with them it's their life you know let them have some input into it well i said i wanted to end on a hopeful note and i think that's a really hopeful message certainly filled me with hope in terms of being a parent myself you know what what can we do and what kind of role can we play Final thing then, plugs. Where can people find out more about you, Leah, and find out more about Diverse Leaders Group? Um, I'm on link LinkedIn, which is probably my most used platform, uh, Leah Jovi Ford, and Diverse Leaders Group has a website, diverseleadersgroup.com. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough, Leah, for joining me in this conversation here today. A pleasure to chat with you as always. Thanks everyone so much for listening. That's enough water cooler chat for today. Let's all get back to work. I'm Ama Iqbal. And I'm Leah Jovi Ford. Stay tuned and I'll see you soon.